So this is kind of a tricky procedure. Find that little mouse skull in utero and inject it with human, stem, human brain stem cells. And if it all goes right, those human brain stem cells will look at the dying mouse brain cells, the dying mouse neurons, and take their place. I will have, says Irv, a human neuron mouse. I'm not sure whether that was his term for it or my term for it, but I will have a mouse all of whose brain neurons are made up of human cells. We're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. So welcome to another episode of the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. So today's topic is something that I think most of us have only really ever come across in science fiction media. And this is animal-human chimeras. I still remember the first time I saw a headline of these chimeras all the way back in 2017, where some were created in a lab in China, and I immediately thought it had to be a joke, but with, uh, I guess, curiosity getting the better of me, I read on for a few sentences and stopped short, being a little bit in a state of disbelief or and shock. So I'm sure the same questions of ethical complications, practical applications, and has science gone too far came floating through your mind the first time that you heard about these or right now, as they did for me. Uh, Since that initial article, though, I've become a little bit more familiar with the topic and therefore substantially more curious about the usefulness of doing such strange and amazing work. And today, I'm lucky enough to have a guest who not only dives into the possible applications of the science, but really clearly lays out the many myriad issues relating to creating such So Henry Greeley, or Hank, specializes in the ethical, legal, and social implications of new biomedical technologies, particularly those related to genetics, assisted reproduction, neuroscience, or stem cell research. He chairs the steering committee for the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics and directs both the Law School Center for Law and the Biosciences and the Stanford Program for Neuroscience and Society. He is professor of genetics at Stanford School of Medicine. He's the author of two books on related subjects and has numerous other accomplishments and relevant positions related to bioethics and emerging technologies. Needless to say, Hank was more than informative on this fascinating topic, and I couldn't have asked for a guest to paint a more comprehensive picture of the science, technology, impacts, and future of chimeras. Anyone who is hearing about animal-human chimeras for the first time should hopefully, by the end of this episode, feel, I think, a mix of being amazed, terrified, informed, and perhaps, as one of my favorite professors used to say, be confused at a higher level. Well, hi there, Hank. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming on to the podcast today to talk about quite a interesting and I think uh, what most people are not too well familiar with, which is uh, animal uh, human hybrids or chimeras. So, thanks for coming on. Happy to do it. Although I'm going to start by um, by correcting your word use. Perfect. <laughs> so, I'm not going to talk about hybrids. As far as I know, there are no human, non human hybrids, although we are all kind of hybrids from different human species. Okay. Since all of us have a little Neanderthal and God knows what else in us. Right. Hybrids are, are mixes, sexually produced mixes between two different species. So, mules are hybrids between mm-hmm. donkeys and horses. What we're talking about is chimeras, which is altogether weirder. And um, with a few exceptions, doesn't happen naturally. But that's where one organism has cells or DNA or something from more than one organism. Those can be within species, mm-hmm. intraspecific chimeras, or between species, interspecific chimeras. And they're both interesting. Right, right. They both involve humans. Yeah, yeah, which is... Um... I, I mean, I've, I first heard about this several years ago. I think there was a uh, a chimera between 
I can't remember if it was um, monkeys and pigs or humans and pigs, and they had to uh, get rid of the embryos or, or essentially kill off the, the embryos uh, because they weren't allowed to become viable. Um, so I first heard about this and it kind of blew my mind. Um, but maybe we can start off with, I mean, you're, you're much more connected to the field than I am. So when did you first hear about this? And was there kind of an immediate shock as to this is actually possible? Or was it already kind of a, okay, we're, we're moving ahead, the innovations are heading along. So this is kind of a, an obvious thing that's coming about. So you gave me an A or B choice, and I'm going to go with C. <laughs> Perfect. But neither of those, it was, wow, this is cool. What all, you know, what all does this mean? And I can't give you an exact date, but some long ago, somewhere around the year 2000, mm -hmm. I ran into a Stanford neurosci uh, a Stanford scientist, a stem cell scientist, who's since become my next door neighbor and a good <laughs> friend. But I think this was the first time I'd ever met him. His name is Irv Weissman, and he's a very, very important stem cell scientist. And somebody had given him my name as somebody who, as a person who might have some thoughts on a experiment he wanted to try. What he wanted to do was take a mouse and a particular kind of inbred mouse where half of the fetuses, the mouse fetuses would die just before birth. And in a mouse pregnancy is like mm -hmm. blink your eye and it's, you've missed it. It's 22, 23 days. Okay. So these mice would go through pregnancy, they'd develop fetuses, and then at about day 20 or 21, shortly before delivery, the brain cells, the neurons in their brains would die, hmm. which meant the mice would be delivered stillborn. What he wanted to do was take that mouse strain, and he had come up with neural stem cells. The stem cells are really interesting, tricky things. And, you could have your basic stem cell that becomes everything, mm -hmm. the human embryonic stem cell, the induced pluripotent stem cell. We know that human embryonic stem cells can become every cell type because that's what made us. And we've got every human cell type. Mm -hmm. People argue about how many different human cell types there are and they, the disagreements, several orders of magnitude, but everybody agrees that embryonic stem cells can make them all. But then you get things like blood forming stem cells and the blood forming stem cells then differentiate into white blood forms forming stem cells and red blood forming stem cells and the red blood forming stem cells differentiate into platelet stem cells and, and erythrocyte, you know, red blood cell, blood cells and so on. So it's complicated. Irv had managed to isolate from fetal tissue brain stem cells, so stem cells that would make neurons in the brain, but also the other kinds of brain cells. And this was his idea. Let's take these mice who develop mouse brains and then have all their neurons die. And shortly before their neurons are going to die, let us inject them in utero. So this is kind of a tricky procedure. Mm. Find that little mouse skull in utero and inject it with human stem, human brain stem cells. And if it all goes right, those human brain stem cells will look at the dying mouse brain cells, the dying mouse neurons, and take their place. Hmm. I will have, says Irv, a human neuron mouse. I'm not sure whether that was his term for it or my term for it, but I will have a mouse all of whose brain neurons are made up of human cells. Now, it eventually led to a paper that I wanted to call, hi, I'm Mickey. But nobody would let me because science journalism, science science, uh, science journals have no sense of humor as far as I can. But um, why did he want to do it? So he could study human brain cells in a living organism in ways that would be unethical to do in humans. So for example, you could try a new chemotherapy drug and see if it hurt the cells. You could hit him up with high levels of radiation and see what it did. You could, you could do all sorts of things to try to make some genes turn on and some turn off in ways that if you did it to a living human, um, it would be deeply unethical and probably harmful, certainly not safe. And it's not safe for the mouse particularly, but we don't care as much about mice. So that was his idea. And my reaction was, ooh, that's really interesting. 
So I pulled together a team of um, people to work with me on it. And we ended up writing a memo to the dean of the medical school, uh, to Irv and to his boss, the dean of the medical school, laying out what we thought the pluses and minuses were and what the issues were. That later got published in 2007 as an article in the American Journal on Bioethics. That's what I wanted to call Hi, I'm Mickey, but got overruled on. Uh, and that was my first exposure to it. I've been fascinated by it ever since. My first publication on it was actually in 2003, before the memo about Irv's human neuro neuron mouse was had become a, a paper. So that's how I got involved, by running into a Stanford colleague who uh, had an interesting problem and he wanted some advice. Hmm. And and this is so some two decades ago that this was kind of first starting, if you will, or the, the first kind of applications were, were able to be done. So it was two decades ago that Irv asked me about this. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, research use of human non-human chimeras goes back a lot deeper. Probably, I've never actually been able to find the first time it was used, but probably into the 40s and 50s, mm. where what you do oh. is take human tumor cells you know, chunks of human tumor and put them in mice or rats so they could study the tumor in mice and rats. Right. Again, sort of looking to see what works and what doesn't. That goes back a long way. All of this work with human, non-human chimeras took a huge leap forward, uh, forward or backward, depending on your perspective. <laughs> right, which we'll get into. Yeah. Once stem cells became available. Yeah. Because, yeah, you could put tumor cells into an animal and they'd live or they'd die, but they're not going to develop into anything particularly interesting other than maybe a bigger tumor. Um, you could put brain cells into a mouse's brain, but they're going to live or die and they're not going to grow and develop. But with stem cells, you could put them in and they might grow, they might develop, they might form organs, they might do all sorts of different things. And really, that dates from about 1997, 1998, mm -hmm. when Jamie Thompson at the University of Wisconsin first was able to isolate human embryonic stem cells. And that's what really made the stem cell field take off. And that's what made the possibilities for this chimera research mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. become much more exciting. But, but you know, um, <laughs> there are hundreds of thousands of humans walking around today who are human, non-human chimeras. If Please define that. that. <laughs> okay, so they are they are organisms that have human body parts and non-human body parts. Um, if you count non-living things, I'm one of them because I've got an artificial hip, okay, ar artificial okay. femur. But what I had in mind was really people who have replacement heart valves. It's not uncommon for heart valves okay. to give out either from age or from disease. And you can replace them. The first way people replaced them was to use heart valves from pigs. Right. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. I, I always love the fact that Senator Jesse Helms, a, I'd call him a Neanderthal, but that's unfair to Neanderthals, an extremely reactionary and racist senator from North Carolina, had pig heart valves. <laughs> it didn't make him oink. Other things were yeah, making yeah, yeah. But so pig heart valves, which are the actual valves from the pig heart, then other people have valves that are carved out of cartilage from cattle. They're not the actual heart valve from the cow, which is too big, but it's carved from yeah. uh, cattle tissue. And other people have plastic valves, and all three are still in use. So mm -hmm. even putting non-human stuff into humans does have some long history. Right. And, and of course, there's an even longer history with putting stuff from one human into another human who becomes a chimera. So somebody who's had a kidney transplant or a heart transplant or a lung transplant has two different genomes, cells from two different people in them. Mm -hmm. And oddly, in the early days of heart transplants, people were worried they didn't want to get a heart from a woman because they were a guy. I mean, a woman's heart would be a problem. And of course, when they were told, hey, it's the woman's heart or you die. Yeah, yeah. That, that clarified Those ideas go away. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there were reports of racist white people who didn't want to get a heart from a black person, for example. Of course. So um, there are these human-human chimeras. That's an intra-within-species chimera. 
And one last little point on this. There are more of them than we think because of two things. Sometimes, a lot, a lot more often than we expect, two eggs get fertilized at the same time and two embryos end up in a uterus at the same time. Mm -hmm. And often one of the embryos dies and gets absorbed by the other one. So there's this really cool case of a woman and her partner who were being sued for welfare fraud because they thought that the guy wasn't the father of the children. It turned out on genetic tests, he was the father of the children, but she wasn't the mother of the children. Crazy. Yeah, and so they said, wait, we didn't use egg donation. They all came out of her. Happily, she was heavily pregnant at that time. So with the mm. next baby, there were witnesses to see that this baby came out. And they tested that baby. And it wasn't a genetic match for the mom. It was kind of, it was similar, but it wasn't yeah. a genetic yeah. match. But it turned out that she was a chimera. Some of her cells were from one embryo, and some of her cells were from another embryo. And the ones they used for to, to establish her DNA were blood cells. But apparently her ovaries were made from the other embryo. Hmm. So wow. she had two different sets of human DNA in her. And so, so we don't know how common that is. Yeah. You see them every once in a while. But much more common, and we, don't, we still don't know how common this is, women who have been pregnant, Often some cells from the fetus will cross the placenta and get into the woman's bloodstream. Hmm. And every once in a while, especially if they are a certain kind of, of blood forming stem cell, they will, they will sit in the woman's bone marrow and be there for decades. So some women carry around their past, carry around cells from their children for all of their lives. The hmm. nature is weirder than we think. Yeah, and I guess the, the the deeper you go into things, it becomes weirder and weirder as time goes on as you as you understand these things. Which, given my personality, is what I love about it. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, so so coming from maybe the outside, like an objective perspective here, it sounds like most of these things that you're that you're describing these these intra chimeras or these chimeras in, that you've been describing, it still sounds like many of them have kind of this chimeric aspect that is a more physical uh, transformation, right? Compared to like some of the articles that have been coming out over the last number of years, it's a much more genetic transformation, right? So it sounds like it's a, it's a surgery versus, you know, something a little bit more complex. Um, my, my question to you though, is has that capability been um, enabled through um, uh, different kinds of innovations and technologies, right? As the as the podcast focuses on technologies a lot, maybe you can touch on that a little bit. So the answer is, of course, because it always is, it depends. Mm. Depends on what kind of chimera you're making and why. If you want to just put tumor cells into a rat, you don't have to do anything to the tumor cells. If you want to put bits and pieces, you know, either individual cells or pieces of human tissue into a non-human you probably aren't going to change the human tissue. You may need to change the non-human's DNA to make it um, not have an immune system that attacks the human cells. So these are called SCIDs, Severe Combined Immune Deficiency. It's like the boy in the bubble disease. Okay. But you can do that. We know how to do that to mice and rats and other animals. So you make a skid mouse, then you put human cells in it, and the mouse's immune system won't attack the human cells, which otherwise it would obliterate quickly. That's a genetic modification. We haven't seen so much of genetically modifying the human cells that you put in, but thanks to the stem cell research, we're now able to put in cells that aren't finished cells, but are cells that could develop in a variety of different ways. So for example, embryonic stem cells are tested to see if they're truly embryonic cells by putting some of them into a rodent and seeing if they form something called a teratoma, which is this weird tumor that has all sorts of different bits and pieces of different body parts in it. Um, if you were just moving regular cells into something, you wouldn't get a teratoma. You could put cells into, you could put say human kidney cells into an early embryo and maybe they would grow a human kidney. 
Now, no one has been able to do that yet, but people mm. have grown pancreases from, let's see, I can always forget which direction it went. They grew mouse pancreases in rats. Okay. Because they started with tissues that were stem cells and were able to grow and develop into something. So the big tech breakthrough here hasn't been in so much in the genetics as it has been in the stem cells. Mm. However, there are some cool genetic potential manipulations. Um, there's something called, well, you can take these human cells and you can put them into a non-human embryo, a non-human fetus, a non-human uh, infant, a non-human adult. Mm. And each, each place you put it has, to, each kind you put it in has different implications. If you put it in an embryo, it could presumably become almost anything. If you put it into an, if you put human brain cells into the brain of a healthy mouse, well, there's not a lot of room for them to grow and develop because there's already a mouse brain there. So that makes a big difference. There's this concept that's really exciting and still pretty early called blastocyst complementation. That's been done for a while, but to use it to try to make human organs is new and not yet very successful, but some of the stories you've seen have been about blastocyst complementation. Mm. And some of them involve genetic manipulations that are interesting, but not of the human cells. So let's say you want to grow a kidney. You want to grow a human kidney in a pig, which would be a really useful thing to do because okay. thousands of people die every year waiting for a kidney transplant or human heart or human liver or so on. You could take a pig embryo when it's really small and put a bunch of human embryonic cells in there. And they would form human embryonic tissues. But uh, human tissues, sometimes mixed with pig cells, sometimes by themselves. But that's not really what you want. You don't want to make a pig where the heart is half human and half pig or the brain is mm -hmm. half human. And it probably wouldn't work. But for some animals and some organs, you can genetically manipulate the animals so that they would not make, say, a pancreas or a kidney or a liver. Hmm. You put the human cells in, the pig cells are going happily along making all the things they should, but there are no pig cells there making a pancreas. Right, right. So and the human cells make the pancreas or make the kidney or make the liver. And there have been experiments with that, both with human cells into sheep and human cells into pigs, and at least one set of experiments with human cells into monkeys, trying to see if the human cells will form part of, form a whole organ or part of an organ. Nobody's had any success so far okay. with the okay. whole organ. And even with the partial organ, it's like, the big success was one cell in 10,000 was human. Right, right, right. I read that. Yeah. Um, which isn't very impressive, except before that, it had always been zero cells in 10,000. Right, right. So they're trying to figure out better ways to do this so they could ultimately grow human organs in a non human thing. Fascinating. Yeah. My, my question, which I guess you've already answered, was you know, how successful is this? Um, and is there is there maybe a a rough timeline as to when this will be successful, or is it never going to be successful? Right, I've read I've read some contradictory opinions out there. So everybody in my world tends to say, "Well, ten years." Right, right. That's always the yeah. nice easy number. Um, I think I think in this case, to actually grow human organs in a non-human, it's probably twenty years, even. Mm first proof of principle and then to be able to prove that it's safe and effective enough to actually use it for transplants is going to be another mm -hmm. five or ten now you know the confidence intervals around that number are very broad i can imagine so, but i can't imagine it happening in less than five and i think 20 sounds about right it's possible that it will never happen mm -hmm. but i think i think that's unlikely um, as we learn more about how cells develop and how they work, I think we'll probably be able to figure out how to do this. But it is possible it will never happen for a completely different reason. 
it may well be that we choose not to or that we don't ever figure it out for the simple reason we come up with better ways of making organs. Yeah. Ideally, um, you, you would like to be able to grow a kidney in a dish. Precisely. Right? And not use non-human animals at all. The non-human mm-hmm. animals come with a number of different problems attached, including possible infections, as well as the, the ethical issues about using the animals. Mm-hmm. People have used stem cells to make one human organ. It is a relatively dumb and easy human organ. It's the bladder. But there are people walking around with sort of stem cell created bladders. There's some plastic mm-hmm. involved too. Um, That would be a solution. Another solution people are looking at is to continue to use pigs, but use pigs that have been genetically altered so that their organs are not attacked by the human immune system. Mm, And there were actually several experiments with this with human beings last year. The guy who got the pig heart Mm -hmm. and lived for 56 days. And then there was a really weird one. I find this, even by my standards, this is weird. Okay, great. (laughs) They made, they took pig kidneys and the kidneys had been modified so that it was expected they'd work better with humans, but they didn't transplant it into a human. Instead, they attached it to the outside of a human, but not a living human exactly. It was, there's not a good term for this. I've taken to calling them life supported cadavers. Okay. It's a person who's been declared dead by neurological criteria, commonly known as brain dead, mm-hmm. but is on a ventilator and is getting nutrition, getting food and water through a tube. Mm-hmm. And those bodies can continue to have the body live right. for decades. Right. So um, in both cases, the goal was to see did this modifying the pig organ so that the human system wouldn't attack it? Did it work? And the answers in both cases are, yeah, kind of, maybe. Mm. So if we did that, we wouldn't need to grow human organs in pigs. So then maybe it would turn out to be better to grow human organs in pigs. And then maybe we'll just come up and make an artificial kidney, an artificial organ. Right. After all, a kidney dialysis machine is kind of an artificial kidney. It's just a clunky and not very good one that's on the outside. Or maybe we'll figure out ways to fix broken organs from the inside. So that's one of the things that is so amazing about this this period in bioscience Mm -hmm. and biomedicine. 20 years ago, all of these were science fiction. Right. Now, each of them is plausible, and probably several of them will turn out to work. But which, if I knew which one would work, I'd be a rich man. Right, 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 right. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, apart from fascinating and incredibly weird, this is also something that I've been questioning quite a bit. Uh, I, I interviewed um, the CEO of, I believe it was bio for life a company out of the United States, and they are attempting to 3D print, essentially, uh, uh, human organs, right? So this is, when I first heard about that, uh, and I looked a little bit more into these chimeras. That was my initial question. Like, why are we producing, creating these chimeras if there's a potential other option that doesn't have any of this, you know, ethical right. maelstrom attached to it? Um, so maybe my follow-up question for you then is, uh, you mentioned it uh, at the beginning, like one of the other possible applications of these chimeras, uh, before we get into the bioethics, which I definitely want to dive into with you, um, you mentioned that there would be, uh, you know, the potential to test other kinds of medicines or figuring out how to stop some sort of diseases. Um, oh. Can you dive into a little bit of that and then maybe touch on, are there any other kind of applications for these chimeras? Sure. Let me finish up, though, on the organs. Yeah. The key word in your sentence was potential. Yes, yes. So the 3D printing might work great. Uh, it hasn't so far, kind of the bladders, um, but it might not. And people aren't potentially dying. People are actually dying. And mm-hmm. so you've got these different pathways. We don't know which one's going to work. Um, there is an argument, at least if it's not grossly unethical, to try them all and see what see what works. Yeah. Um there are, and it's been done for, for a while. There are ways to put human tissues into non-humans and use them to see whether drugs work, whether radiation works, and so on. 
at some of the early tumor studies. You put the tumor in to and then attack the tumor. Mm-hmm. And you can if the mouse dies, it's a lot better than using chemotherapy that kills the patient. Yeah. Kills the human patient. So uh, one of the more interesting ones gets into another area that I haven't talked about. Um, organoids. So yes. and in particular, neural organoids, brain organoids. So with stem cells, for a long time, we've been able to take cells and keep them alive in Petri dishes, but just in flat two-dimensional things. Mm-hmm. And they're alive, and it's better to study live cells than dead cells. Um, Two-dimensional sheets of neurons don't look very much like human brains, and they don't act very much like human brains, but it gives you some information. You put those into a mouse or a rat, and it gives you maybe a little bit more information because cells inside a living organism act different from cells outside a living organism. But in the last decade or so, people have been able to make three-dimensional things that are called organoids from stem cells. Um, they started actually with uh, gut cells, but now there are organoids for all sorts of different human cell types, mm-hmm. including brains. It is the case that the ones that make people craziest are brain cells. Um, and Frank, I, I have a piece um, that I actually wanted to call Brains, Balls, and Beauty. Um, I think the three areas that people have the most concerns about are brains. Mm-hmm. So you, you don't really want a rat with a human brain. Balls, which alliterated nicely, but should have been gonads. You don't want a rat with human uh, testicles or yeah. human uh, ovaries, because mm-hmm. you certainly don't want a human embryo inside a mouse. Uh, and then third, beauty, which was sort of shorthand for outward appearance. Mm-hmm. Do you remember back in the 90s? You're not old enough to remember back in the 90s. But you've probably seen it. In 1996, a guy named Charles Vacanti published a picture of a mouse that became quite iconic. It's a mouse that looks like it has a human ear sticking up out of its back. Yes, yes, absolutely. So you, you remember yeah, seeing crazy. That. Yeah, 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 I definitely remember seeing and and uh, definitely weirded out by that. <laughs> Was <laughs> upon your first, first reaction yuck or cool? Yeah, disgust. Uh, disgust maybe followed by cool but i don't think i had been fully immersed in the ideas of like technology is fascinating and this you know sure. technological wave is coming so i think it was discussed when i first so i think a lot of that. people had a yuck reaction a yeah. lot of people had a cool reaction and a fair number of people had both at the same time the weird thing about that is there was nothing human in that animal hmm. it was a plastic shell of kind of an ear shape that was populated by uh, cartilage cells from cattle Okay. There were no human cells okay. in it, but it looked human. And that freaked mm-hmm. people out. Well, I think with chimeras, if you had a chimera, if you had a monkey with a human nose, that freaked yeah. people out. Yeah. If you had a an animal with a human voice, yeah. that would freak people out. Or uh, an animal that cried human tears. So I think we care about the brains. We care about the gonads, and we care about appearance. Yeah. Of all those, I think the one that's probably most important is the brains. And so people have been, but brains are also important for all sorts of reasons. And mental brain diseases are the greatest scourge of humanity on the face of the earth. Between mental illness and neurological disease, every one of us is going to have a close encounter with that for ourselves in many cases and for ones we love almost certainly. And we're crummy at dealing with them and we haven't gotten much better. You know, brain disease has not profited as say cancer studies have from a lot of new biotech innovations. So it's really hard to study developing human brains. Um, (laughs) You know, you can only take embryos so far. And I can't um, take I, I can't do something to your brain and then take it out of your skull and cut it up and look at it under an electron scanning microscope and then put it back. Right. Or I could, but yet. yet. <laughs> right. Um, so people said, let's make 
let's use brain forming stem cells and make these things that develop and change and maybe it'll tell us something about how brain cells develop and change in embryos. Now these organoids are about the size of a pea. They're hollow, they're hollow spheres. And the, the reason for that is they don't have any blood vessels. So every cell needs to be able to get the, the culture medium, the fluid that mm -hmm. has the sugars and the oxygen and so on. And that puts a limit on their size. Okay. But even the size of a hollow pea, uh, a, a neural organoid can have two, four, six million neurons. Now, that's a big number, but you and I both have about 89 billion neurons right. in our brains. Right. On the other hand, a mouse has about 60 million neurons, and a bumblebee hmm. has about 1 million. So these organoids have more brain cells, have more neurons than a bumblebee. And bumblebees are capable of some pretty damn sophisticated behavior. Mm -hmm. So you make these organoids, and one big ethical question has been, what are they? How should we treat them? Do we have to worry about them feeling pain? Some people have said, do we have to worry about them becoming conscious humans? Well, that's a long way off, both in size and in the, the formation. Mm -hmm. A real problem for the field is journalists love to call them mini brains, but they're not mini brains. They're not, yeah. Brains have have all have the cerebrum, the the midbrain, the brain stem. The cerebrum has two hemispheres and four lobes, and these have none of that. But you mm -hmm. can make an organoid from say cells from the hippocampus, which is an area of the brain that specialized in making memories. Mm -hmm. And maybe that'll tell you something about how the hippocampus develops normally or abnormally or, or so on. Here's the payoff. A friend of mine here at Stanford is a neuroscientist named Sergio Pashka. And in last October of 2022, he published, I think, an amazing paper in Nature where he took human brain organoids and transplanted them into baby rats, newborn rats. Now, when a rat is newborn, its brain, it's got some brain, but it's not very big yet. Okay. So he discovered first that the organoids would live happily in the rat brain, and they would, in fact, integrate. They would be able to grow larger because the rat blood vessels mm. would feed the human organoid. And so it was no longer restricted to this tiny little pea That's because it got blood supply and they would make connections to the rat brain neurons. Mm -hmm. So that's one big story. Second big story, he found that when you tickled the whiskers on rats, and whiskers, unlike on you and me, yep. whiskers mm -hmm. on rats are major sensory organs. Right. right. Um, he put these human neurons, neuron, neuronal organoids in a location and with neuron types that are involved in sensation and motion, the, the um, sensomotory area, sensory motor area of the brain. He found that when you tickled the rat's whiskers, the human brain cells fired. Hmm. So they were getting messages from the rat body. Then using a tricky thing invented at Stanford called optogenetics, he fired certain neurons in the human part of this now part human, part non-human brain. And when he fired those cells, the rats went to get a drink of water. And when he stopped firing them, they stopped getting water. And he could make them drink all day long. Crazy. So, so they integrate well. They sense, they process rat sensations. Mm -hmm. They can cause rat behavior. And then the coolest part, and this is what's finally answering your question, I hope. <laughs> um, like, like humans, rat brains, the cerebrum has two hemispheres, a left and a right. And in one of the hemispheres, he took a human neural organoid made from a healthy person, made from skin cells of a healthy person that had been turned into what are called induced pluripotent stem cells that mm -hmm. had been turned into neural stem cells, etc. And it grew... And it grew much better in the rat brain, probably because of the blood vessels, than it did in a dish. And it made up ultimately a sixth of 
the size of that rat brain, of that hemisphere of the rat, one sixth. And it was really interesting to see it develop because it developed in ways you couldn't see in a dish. In the other hemisphere, same rat, he took an organoid made from the cells of a person with a condition called Timothy syndrome. Timothy syndrome is a particularly severe form of autism okay. that is genetically determined. Maybe one autistic person in a thousand has Timothy syndrome. It's not a common cause of autism, mm -hmm. but it has the advantage for this purpose of there's a particular gene when it's broken, you get Timothy syndrome. So he put that in the rat and it also grew and developed and changed in ways they'd never seen in the dish. Now, his hope is by looking at that, he can learn and comparing the two hemispheres of the rat brain, one with the healthy human tissue and one with the unhealthy human tissue, he can learn something about Timothy syndrome, about how it's caused, how it develops, how it can be treated or prevented. He doesn't know that, but yeah. that's science. You know, you, you never know the answer until you've finished the experiments. And even then, you never really know the full answer forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's a really exciting use of organoids to try to learn something about human disease. And mm -hmm. you couldn't do that in a human because it would right. be really unethical to take Timothy syndrome cells and put them in a baby human. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, fascinating. Uh, I see that we're uh, coming up closer to the, to the time that we have allotted. Um, I, I can't let you go until we talk a little bit more about the ethics, I think. Sure. Right? So as, as I'm listening to you, as I've read uh, a number of articles and, uh, I guess, insights on this fascinating new area of, of science and the technologies behind it, um, I've read many people explain that, you know, we are, in essence, starting to play God right now. I'm not necessarily a religious person, but I think that the, the terms fit. Um, where do we kind of see ourselves in the next, I hate to say it, but 10 years time, um, specifically with regards to changing, I guess, the nature of what it means to be an animal, what it means to be a human, and how do we, or what are some of, I guess, the, the main issues that you see coming about now? Sure. Um, you've mentioned you've mentioned the brains, you've mentioned uh, other aspects, but is there something that's maybe more overarching than than some of the things that you've mentioned sure. before. Let me tell you first about some of the ethical issues with chimeras that do worry me. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then talk about this one, which actually doesn't worry me very much. Okay. Um, one thing that does worry me is animal welfare. Yeah. You know, if, and, and Sergio, and I should, I should note that I consulted with him about the ethics of this experiment before he tried it. He watched the behavior of those rats very carefully. And they seem to be, they didn't seem to be in pain. They didn't seem to be in distress and they didn't seem to be acting abnormally. Um, if doing this caused great pain and distress to the animal you're doing it to, that's a problem. Yeah. Now, if we do animal research, we cause them pain and distress, but there are limits on it. There are committees that have to decide that it's okay. And there are limits on how much pain you can cause and you've got to have a good reason and so on. So I think animal welfare is a really appropriate concern mm -hmm. in doing human non-human chimeric research um the concern about playing god though i'm less nervous about uh, for one thing if we were to make a pig with a human kidney i'm not sure god would care very much <laughs> if we made a pig with a human brain that yeah. said hi i'm porky yes. yes um i'm still not sure whether god would care uh, not having any insight into even the existence of God, let alone whether she has a brain and what, what she cares <laughs> about. But um, that, I think, is more worrisome. So making non-human animals that have human brain and behavioral characteristics is worrisome. Yeah. Um, and that'd be worrisome even with the organoid in a dish, even if you don't put it into a rat. But if the mouse were to stand on its hind legs and say, hi, I'm Mickey, um, that's an issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's a killer issue or not, uh, but it's one that shouldn't be walked into lightly. 
It's basically creating, if you took it far enough, and I don't think you could possibly do this with mice and rats because their brains are too small. Right, right. Although birds are awfully intelligent and they have small and odd brains. Um, some birds, especially uh, corvids. Um, if you did this, you'd be creating another intelligent species. Precisely. And that raises questions about how do we treat it? What should we mm-hmm. do with it? And these are the same sorts of questions that Star Trek The Next Generation did every other week with, is Data the Android a person or not? <laughs> right, right. So you can get there through androids and artificial intelligence. Precisely. Like the guy at Google who got fired after he said that the, the mm-hmm. AI was was conscious and talking yep. to him. Yep. Yep. Um, but you can also get there by enhancing animals. And there I think it's something that... that it's a political and social decision by humanity, whether we want to try to do this. It, and, you know, we could, the little green men could come down, or little green women could come down, and we'd face kind of the issue, are they people? Can we murder them? Can we eat them? Mm-hmm. Do they get the vote? Et cetera. Maybe we'll figure out how to communicate with dolphins, raising a similar kind of question. Chimeras could, in theory, do that. I think it's a long, long way off. Yeah. But then there's still the deeper question of, is this just wrong? Is this the sort of thing humans should not do this? And I can't mm-hmm. tell you how often I get that stupid Jeff Goldblum thing from uh, Jurassic, Jurassic Park, Park about, yeah. you know, we worry about whether we can do something, but not whether we should. Yeah. Well, I think we should worry about whether we should, but that's not a saying should we or not, doesn't answer the question. That's a question to ask. The answer isn't obvious. Mm -hmm. And of course, the moral people drive from that is, look what happened in Jurassic Park, to which my response is, hey, that was a movie. Yeah, Yeah. It was a book and then a movie. It's fiction. And fiction needs drama. Mm -hmm. Fiction overrepresents dystopias and bad results, so our heroes can win out at the end. (laughs) It's um, real life is much more muddling through and things are usually not nearly as dramatic. So is this stuff we shouldn't do? One argument is you shouldn't mix different species. But we've been doing that for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. In a way, some of this could go back to the Old Testament and the idea that you shouldn't uh, plant two different types of seeds in the same field. Um, Was there ever a good reason for that? Not clear to me that you shouldn't eat Mm -hmm. meat and milk together. Uh, Another kind of strange one, but this sort of purity and separation, there's almost kind of a, it gives me almost racist vibes of the sense Mm -hmm. of you have to keep, different things are inherently different and you have to keep them separate. So there's that idea, which I don't give a lot of credence to, particularly since species aren't, Species aren't platonic ideals. They're tags we put on Mm. groups of organisms that overlap with other similar groups of organisms. It's all kind of mushy clouds. Almost every gene you and I have is found in almost every vertebrate in the world. And there's some of our genes are almost exact duplicates of genes found in some bacteria. Mm -hmm. So the separateness thing bothers me. Uh, But I guess the deepest thing is, on playing God, one of my favorite thinkers is a really interesting character, charismatic, human charismatic megafauna named Stuart Brand. He created the Whole Earth Catalog. There's a new biography out about him. He's just one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. And in the Whole Earth Catalog, their motto was, "We, we have become as God's we need to get used to it. Hmm. This is not my natural fur. Right. These are not my eyes. You and I are not actually talking face to face, although I see your face. Um, mm-hmm. Humans, I think the best, the, the biggest thing humans have done over our existence is to play God. We keep changing our environment. We change ourselves. By changing our environment, we change ourselves. Our jaws are different from our ancestors' jaws because we eat softer food. Mm -hmm. 
which is part of why um, wisdom teeth that used to be useful are now just a plague because our jaws aren't big enough to, for them to really fit very well. Right. Right, right. You and I have more copies of a gene for digesting starch than our hunter-gatherer ancestors did because agriculture put a premium on people who could digest starch well. Mm -hmm. And there are more people running around with bad genes for type 1 diabetes than 100 years ago because we figured out how to let people with type 1 diabetes, known as juvenile diabetes, live long enough to have kids. Mm -hmm. So we change the world and ourselves all the time. Um, the question is, do we do it wisely? And the answer is sometimes, but rarely, um, most of the time we don't think about it. Uh, we need to think about it. You know, I think in some respects, climate change is the best example of unconscious, inadvertent. We didn't know what we were doing. And then by the time we figured out what we were doing, there was a multi-trillion dollar industry that wanted to make sure we kept doing what we had been doing and we all got used to it. I'm a Californian, so I'm half human, half car. Uh, and cars have changed our lives just incredible ways, including smog and what we breathe, but also how we date and how we have sex and where we live. We haven't paid much attention to the consequences of our actions for interesting historical and social reasons, we're paying more attention to it these days, but mainly with respect to biology, mm -hmm. which is important. But this supercomputer that I carry around in my pocket, this has changed the world in enormous ways. And nobody sat down in advance and said, hey, we better have a commission to see whether smartphones are a good idea or not. So. Yes, we are playing God. We have been playing God. We'll keep playing God, and we better get we better get good at it. Now, I think Stuart has changed that from, you know, we should get good to it to we have to get good at it. Yeah. Well, I think I think also, I mean, th thank you for that. It was fascinating and I think beautifully put. But I think also one of the things that might be changing nowadays is that with the technologies that are available to more and more people, right? The democrat uh, democratization of of technologies, um, the impact can be so much larger than it was in the past, right? So you know, here we're talking about chimeras. Um, you know, I talked previously about uh, AI. As as everybody's t speaking about, there's also you know concerns of. By the way, I've been uh, reading all my answers off of Chat GTP. So. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been reading all my questions. Um, yeah, but I, I think that like the previous ethical considerations were valid for for generations, as you mentioned. Um, do you see maybe that as as our technologies get more powerful, there might need to be a shift in the ethical considerations that were that we're considering now or because change is just a, a natural and maybe the most natural part of human beings, that this is just something that's going to be happening forever as long as we're still around. So last time you gave me an A or B, I said C. This time you <laughs> gave me A or B and I'm going to say yes. Okay. I think both those things are true. And, and yeah. as always, it depends. So human and non-human chimeras are unlikely to have much effect on the 8 billion humans. If yeah. everything goes well, maybe some of them, when they, if they lose a kidney or need a heart transplant or something, they'll get something to help. Maybe we'll have some disease treatments that we learn through research on them that could have effects. This has day-to-day -day impacts. And, you know, this yeah. is kind of the most quickly adopted technology I can think of. I think half yeah. the people on the planet, even those who are dirt poor, have phones and often smartphones. Um, so it depends on the potential, well, the foreseeable degree of impact, um, both in terms of the number of people who are affected and how strongly it affects each of them. And that's mm -hmm. going to vary from technology to technology, but also within technologies from application to application. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be a good way to deal with it. There's this interesting concept in science technology studies, STS, 
called the Colin Ridge Dilemma, named after some guy named Colin Ridge, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. who I once knew something about, but I forget. <laughs> but here's the dilemma, which is, is very real. The best time, the easiest time to regulate a new technology is at the very beginning before it becomes entrenched. Yeah. But you don't know what's going to happen best time when you know the most to regulate it is after it's been out there for a while and you know more about it and you can see what's good and bad but then it's really hard to regulate for political reasons because it's become entrenched yeah i don't have a good answer for that but i think when we think about technology assessment for historical and cultural reasons we've largely looked at the biosciences i'm not opposed to that but I think we need to extend our look, our, our reach farther and look at other things. Mm-hmm. We've done it kind of piecemeal. The National Environmental Protection Act setting up environmental impact statements. Interesting way to think about things. But, mm. you know, it didn't apply to cars when they started. Uh, and it doesn't apply to very much. It only applies to federal activity. Uh, and it doesn't stop or start anything. It just says you got to think about it, and write something up about it which like most bureaucratized things becomes kind of bureaucratic um, boilerplate and or gibberish. I think we need to take take the possible implications more seriously. Having said that, our ability to predict things is not very good. There's a line that usually sometimes gets attributed to Yogi Berra. I think the best source is probably Niels Bohr, the physicist, although... Mm -hmm may have been a different Dane who said it. It's always hard to predict things, especially the future. Right. But actually it's wrong. (laughs) It's easy to predict the future. It's just hard to be right about it. So I'm in favor, and I wrote something about this recently, of kind of a a two-step approach. We need to spend more time scanning the horizon, looking at technologies that could have a substantial effect and thinking about, do we have to worry about them Mm. Do we just have to keep an eye on them? Is this not going to be important at all? But I also think that the tail end is more important. We need to monitor technologies that have been introduced and get a better idea of what they're doing. How Mm -hmm. widely are they getting used? Are they good or bad? Are they having big influences one way or the other? And one would hope that monitoring would come along with some sort of hooks that could be, make it easier to revise them once we decide that there are things that are going wrong. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, we kind of do that. Nobody's nobody's saying get rid of, well, there are no serious proposals to completely get rid of cars, at least in the United States or in California, though to get rid of the internal combustion engine is moving right along. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, you know, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has been, requiring seat belts and requiring cars to be improved. We will tinker at the edges sometimes, uh, but it's hard to do something basic. And I think we need to pay more attention to the consequences of what are, what's happening and be able to make midterm mid course corrections. Right. Because our ability to predict the future accurately is very small. Yeah. The political events of the last six or seven years have only increased my belief that nobody knows nothing. <laughs> well, maybe that's a, uh, a perfect place to, to end the conversation. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, Hank. I think you've given me a ton to think about, to digest, and I'm sure the audience as well will, will be, I don't know, very confused, but also maybe a little bit more... Ha- I had a, I had a professor years ago. He said, uh, "You might be confused now, but at least you're confused on a higher level." So I, I think or, if, or if a lower any... level. I mean, yeah. <laughs> or, 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 <laughs> no, no. I I think it's a higher level. So I think a lot of science just moves our confusion to a deeper and more profound level. Yeah, 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 definitely. But I kind of um, believe it's not infinitely complicated. That it's not turtles all the way down. We yeah, do make some progress. Yeah, yeah, and and I think like once. Um, Maybe this is the first time for several people to even hear about chimeras. Yeah. But, you know, I've I've read I've read a little bit about it over the years, and I think hearing your your insights kind of gives a better framing of what's going on, what might be happening, and some of the challenges, ethical and otherwise. So, so one other cool story. Yes. Yes. Go one. ahead. <laughs> the word chimera. 
Yes. It comes out of Greek myth. Mm -hmm. It's actually based on the classical Greek word for a she-goat. And this okay. is a this is a really interesting myth because it involves that classic story of young prince wanders into a different kingdom, falls in love with the princess. The father is disapproving, but the father eventually says, so, okay, do me this one little favor and you can have my daughter's hand. There's this thing up in the mountains that's been troubling my people. Kill it and you can marry her. And the thing turns out to be a monster with the body of a lion or a goat, and the, I guess the body of a goat, the head of a lion, and the tail of a snake. Right, right. Called a chimera. Sometimes in the ancient statutes, you see one body with three different heads. But mm -hmm. And so our hero manages successfully to kill it because he has a secret weapon that his uh, future father-in-law doesn't know about. He has the world's first air force. It's Bellerophon, and he's flying Pegasus. The basic Pegasus myth is about okay, killing America. Okay, wild. Hmm. It's got to have some deep meaning somewhere. I'm not sure what it is, but I'll I'll, I'll look into it, and I will add uh, some some link if there is some kind of deeper truth to that that somebody has. Uh, uh, dived into into uh, the show notes. You might actually want to show a, a picture of one of the extant statues of the Chimera. Yeah. I, I, so what I do for most episodes is I use um, generative AI to create a picture of whatever the, the topic is that we're talking about. So I'm sure I'll be fiddling with uh, with some of these AI programs yeah. to create some beautiful picture of, uh, of a Chimera. You know, part of what's going on is human myth and religion has long had Chimeras. So the Sphinx mm. is a Chimera. Mm -hmm. Ganesh, the Hindu god with the elephant head. Right. Chimera. Right. Right. So we've mixed humans and non humans in fantasy forever, mm -hmm. uh, but usually in ways that are kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and in fantasy, science fiction, whereas now we're moving yeah. into uh, a real world situation. Yep. Um, Hank, I won't take up any more of your time. Uh, okay. Where's the best place that people can follow you, uh, read your work? Uh, get in touch with you if uh, if you so desire. So um, I, I tweet way too much. Perfect. Where I'm Hank Greeley LSJU because somebody somewhere picked up Hank Greeley, even though I think I'm the only <laughs> Hank Greeley in the world. Um, and they can see, they can follow me there. The law, My website at the law school gives some more information about me. Uh, my email address is H Greeley, G R E E L Y. People tend to want to put an extra E in between the L and the Y at stanford.edu. And uh, I promise to think about trying to respond to any email somebody sends. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I do, I've written quite a few things over the years about chimeras, mm -hmm. and I'd be happy to. Uh, give people the list or send them the PDFs if they're that interested. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thanks again. Um, certainly, as I mentioned before, it gave me a lot to, to ponder. Um, yeah. And I, I think that this is perhaps one of the more interesting topics to pay attention to over the, over the next couple of years. So, uh, you know, if there's some kind of crazy breakthrough over the next several years, I'll probably have to have you back on and uh, discuss exactly what's going on in this fascinating and very weird uh, space in science and technology. Yeah, although is there how much of a difference is there? What's the line between weird and cool? <laughs> I think there's got to be some sort of uh, overlap uh, with that because uh, yeah. as long as long as you don't have this total disgust factor, um, then I think that things can be uh, have emerged between those two things. Okay, all right. Well, nice talking to you. Good luck with this, and good luck editing it down. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Thanks again, Hank. So, thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard, here are a number of ways that you can go out and support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or even give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step -step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes on the website or the YouTube channel where you can also see video recordings of each of the interviews. 
And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, you can get in touch with me to hear about the strategic foresight services I offer and how I can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future. A lot of future shock people and future shock institutions in our society are simply overwhelmed. Once there is super intelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the super intelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10 year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's gonna reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization.